Welcome to I Testify Conversation Station. Today's topic is racial prejudice. My name is Jewel, aka J. It's Maurice Rose. Our quote of the day is brought to us from Ellen G. White, which says, the color of skin does not determine character in the heavenly courts. The character makes the man. Um, Our topic of discussion is something that I won't say is prevalent today specifically, but it has definitely been something of importance in our society for a while now. However, with recent events happening around the world, it is definitely something that we want to discuss and, you know, dig a little bit deeper in and kind of explore further. And that topic is racial prejudice. So I was driving back to the city with my friend one day. We randomly get pulled over on the highway. Without no questions and without no words, we were ripped out of the car, slammed against the car, and handcuffed for no reason. They began to tell us that we were arrested for the possession of controlled substances, as to which we both didn't have. They ripped apart the car and found nothing. They continued to search us intensely. They continued to tell us that we were lying and we were hiding something or we threw it away. They treated us rough for about an hour and a half and just let us go. How does racism make you feel? Um, at this point, I feel no ways about racism. We've been so accustomed and conditioned to feel like racism is absolutely nothing. At this point, the only thing we can do is do better as ourselves and as a people to show them what we're not and what we really are. So for today's conversation, we're going to want to focus on the following questions. What is racism? What does it look like in Canada? And how does racism make you feel? And then finally, we're going to talk about identity, purpose, mission, and what our call to action is. What is our mission and what is Christ's mission for us? So, Biggs, what is your take on racism? Simply put, one race putting themselves above another race and actions that back up a level of hatred, disgust in some cases, and also a situation where if it was just prejudice, it would be a little bit underlying. Mm. But racism is like a full-blown action. Okay. So a lot of people, when we talk about what racism is, have an understanding that there has to be a majority versus a minority yes. when it comes to dealing with racism. So mm-hmm. do you feel that a minority group can be racist towards a majority group? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if, we, if we take a look at what our majorities, what our majorities and minorities are, Mm-hmm. We we tend to almost always gravitate to Caucasian mm-hmm. and and Negroid or Black people. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it's forgotten that the racism is not just to those two cultures or to those two races. Uh, I believe that it also can expand and does expand in Canada and sometimes is not spoken about but the native people, the people that were here first, mm-hmm. um, the way the land was taken from them, the, the treaties, the, the forcible education in the schooling that was done, um, that's, that's a, a big one. And sometimes we find that it actually gets pushed aside, especially in our current climate. And you know, it's very interesting that you describe it as having a distaste for another race of people or individuals. Because a lot of times, um, that same example that you've brought up where someone will mention, oh, well, you know, I'm not racist because I have a black friend, or I'm not racist because I have a friend of this race or this Mm -hmm. culture, as if to say that that is a badge of honor or it's a pass, 
as long as you check this box and you meet that criteria, then you could definitely not be a racist. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also think it's important to highlight that sometimes it's very subtle and it doesn't come off as being um, necessarily as aggressive um, and as deeply rooted as a level of hatred that you'll see in the media or that you'll see, you know, examples of when people are posting their experiences in public. Um, but it is ex- exactly that. It is, in fact, just you feeling comfortable using a derogatory slur or a derogatory term to refer to a group of people. Mm-hmm. It, it implies that you view them as less than and you don't view them as being of equal value to you and that whatever race you are therefore makes you superior. Right. So I think that's very important to highlight um, and, and bring to people's awareness that it it's as simple as you, you know, tr- intentionally saying certain things around specific groups of people because right. you feel like you can get away with it. Exactly. And that's not okay. Cause it, this, the point you brought up is now you're questioning what happens in your home, mm-hmm. what happens behind closed doors. And if you're a family that's raising children, what are you teaching your children? Yeah. Right. And we see that it starts at that young of an age. It starts with the children. And that's not something that, you're just born, you know, believing that, yeah, I'm better than everybody else because of X, Y, Z. Those are principles that are usually taught as early on as in the home. Speaking of that, I think now would be a great time to take a listen or take a look at another um, experience that was shared that touches a little bit about um, or a little bit on that exact type of experience. So let's take a look. I remember when we were growing up, the most popular game we'd play in school was house. I remember whenever we played house, I'd always have to play the role of the dad. My friends always told me I had to be the dad because of my hair, because it was short and usually braided in cornrows on my head. They would single me out for it during that game. Even when I'd ask if we could switch for once, the answer was always, you look the most like a boy. You have to be the dad. I also remember an instance with a friend during elementary school when we were in the bathroom together. She pinched my skin, causing me to yelp. Surprised, she jumped back. That hurts, she asked. I looked at her with wide eyes saying, yes, with a dumbfounded expression. She seemed dubious and went on to ask me if I knew that if I peeled my skin off, I'd be white underneath. You should try it, she she ended. I didn't know what to say, so I just nodded, and we walked out of the bathroom. Wow. What an experience. That's a, that's a terrible experience. Um, I can think back when I was a child where I was at school, and the kids said I needed to go and clean myself because I was dirty. Mm. And it was never as harsh Not to say that that wasn't harsh, Mm -hmm. but to tell a child to peel their skin off so they could see the white underneath, that's deliberate. It's savage. Yeah, um, just listening to that experience brought a couple things to my mind. Um, For one, I... And having similar experiences, you don't, sometimes in the moment, don't realize the impact Mm -hmm. of what is being said to you or what you're being told to do or the comments that are being made. Mm -hmm. You do have a feeling that this this feels mean or that comment didn't feel very nice. Mm -hmm. Or you walk away from that interaction feeling sad almost and, you know, questioning the things that were said to you. I remember, you know, myself just having experiences similar to that where, you know, it's getting, I'm I'm getting picked on for what my hair looked like or the fact that, oh no, like you just, you're not as pretty as the other girls because you look different. Mm. So therefore, you know, you can't really play with us or maybe you should hang out with those people over there because they look like they'll be your friends. And it would just be a very 
politely just redirecting me to different spaces because I wasn't accepted in their spaces. Um, and as a child, you're, you, you know it feels wrong, but you know you just brush it off a little bit and just keep going about your day and just trying to you know, find ways to enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your childhood overall at that young of an age. And you know, the fact that that story and that experience stuck with this person mm-hmm. So that they can share it now and I'm, I'm better understand the implications just goes to show how the smallest interactions and kind of what we were talking about earlier, how you just saying a slur mm-hmm. could have a long lasting impact on mm-hmm. someone's life. You just, you know, maybe seeing it in light manner or just joking about it. The joke could be taken the wrong way. It's it's sad that. You know, as a child who, you know, was told to peel off their black skin, that they've had to grow thicker skin. Thicker skin, exactly. (laughs) To deal with that kind of, you know, like those kind of comments. Mm -hmm. And especially in a school phase, elementary school, you're with the same people in your class. So you're seeing that person every day. I'm sitting here and we're hearing it and we're talking about it. And it's just, it saddens my heart Mm -hmm. to like realize that somebody had to go through that. Mm -hmm. And then someone also put that in the mind of a child to say it to someone else. Right. Right. So it, it just makes you, you know, feel really, really sad. And it also, we have to think about the fact that it could be very easy to get very angry because then that Mm -hmm. same child would want to go home or most likely went home and spoke to her parents and said, mom, dad, this is what was said to me. And then how was that reaction? Because it's very easy to react in a very upset, Mm -hmm. rage type manner. Or even the opposite reaction. The child could have easily just internalized that experience and had to just deal with it. So there's a lot of ways that I think people in, you know, deal and react to um, those type of experiences and situations. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, again, it's, it saddens me that a lot of times um, children of minority groups and children of different races don't typically seem to have the typical poster childhood yeah. experience. No. They don't get that. You know, they don't get to just play outside in the yard and just live a carefree, childlike life. Mm -hmm. They have to think about, okay, make sure that I'm being safe. Make sure I'm with groups. Make sure that my parents know where I am. Make sure that after certain hours, I'm not doing certain things. If I see a police officer, this is how I'm supposed to react. Mm -hmm. If my friends are encouraging me to do this, I need to do X, Y, Z to protect myself. And all those adult-like thoughts That's right. are now being pushed onto young minds to have to think about so that they can survive almost. Exactly. And it's as if there's a point in time where you automatically switch from living to surviving. And that thought alone, I think, is very sad. Very, very. I, I, I agree with you. It's just to think that someone, that anyone is subjected to like a listing of, okay, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Mm -hmm. It's sad. All right. Okay, so let's talk about what racism looks like in Canada. Um, I believe you touched on it a little bit earlier, um, and I really appreciate um, the perspective of including those of Aboriginal descent into this category of people that suffer from racial injustice Mm -hmm. because I do agree that a lot of times that demographic is overlooked. So what what do you think racism looks like in Canada? We see what's happening in the media. We see everything that's making, you know, news headlines. But a lot of people are inclined to think that, well, that's just America. That's just because they have the leadership that they have or that's just because their country was built off of racial injustice and it's systematic racism. Mm. But we're Canada. We're not like that. We're not like that. Back in the day, people fled to our country for freedom. So we're we're definitely not like that. (laughs) So what Uh, do you think, like what does racism look like in Canada or even in your specific community, for example? Okay, so in in Canada, um, 
I will, I'll talk about two quick experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years back, I was in a, in a, in a taxi um, heading from my home to my workplace and I thought nothing of it to be speaking to my colleague even though the relationship, of course, unknown to the cab driver, but the relationship was, she was my d report, mm -hmm. so she, she reported to me. Um, but we were talking about things that needed to be done at work. And I was having the conversation, you know, just naturally. Mm -hmm. And as I was getting out of the cab, the cab driver whipped around. Yes, it was a white woman. And she looked at me and said, where did you go to school? And I said, I went to Mohawk. And I remember the day distinctly because it was a Friday and I was more casually dressed. I had a t-shirt on and jeans and I might have had on a pair of boots. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking how I sounded on the phone. Ah. So when she turned around and asked me that, I said, initially I started to say Mohawk College and then this flash in my mind just said, the school of life. And she said, well, you were having that conversation, not that I was eavesdropping, but you were talking about all these things. And I said, yeah, I'm a manager in a call center and we we're figuring out some issues and I was talking to my colleague. Mm -hmm. I figured that was a natural conversation. She didn't say... I can't expect you to be talking like that because you're black or because you're wearing clothing that makes you just look casual. Right. But it was very clearly understood because she was shocked that I could have had that type of conversation. Mm. And I know I could tell that the words were being chosen carefully so that I would not respond in a certain way. Mm. And I thought... Okay, you know how to you know how to play in this pool, but you actually didn't fill it up with water. Mm. Is all I could think. Wow! So. Wow! <laughs> Bigs, <laughs> Bigs. <laughs> and you know what's interesting? We I feel that a lot of people can relate to what you've shared in the professional environment. Yes. It's yes. extremely subtle. Yeah. And we find that a lot of people have to be, they are very premeditative and careful with how they choose their words yeah. so that they can imply what needs to be implied without on paper yes. saying anything that would have to warrant us taking yeah. it to HR or exactly. escalating the situation further. Yeah. So it is very interesting that you brought that up. Yeah. Um, I wanted to take a look at a couple other clips um, mm -hmm. that talk about some more experiences of what it's like dealing with racism in Canada and um, in a work environment as well, too, like you mm -hmm. mentioned. So yeah. let's take a quick look. My most memorable encounter with racism happened in high school. Um, I was best friends with a girl and we would go to each other's houses all the time and we would sleep over and eat dinner together. We were very, very close. Um, near the end of our friendship, there was a falling out. And during this falling out, she proceeded to harass me and another friend online. She called me racial slurs, she called me the N-word. I took the evidence of the online harassment to the police and they told me it was teenage drama and the threats were nothing to worry about and there was nothing that they could do. A couple days later, um, we went to school and we were called into the principal's office. My ex-best friend and her father told the principal that me and my friend went to their house in the middle of the night and slashed the tires on his truck, which we didn't but the principal didn't believe us. We didn't get in trouble because it was an off school property incident, um, but we did get talked to. Uh, looking back, it was a really hard experience to go through. I felt 
like the adults that were supposed to help me, like the police and the principal didn't. Um, and I felt betrayed because I loved this person and I didn't realize that's how they felt about black people. Oh, my name's Eddie, I'm here to talk about uh, racism within the workplace. Because I work in HR, I have a very unique perspective on things like imposter syndrome or microaggressions, you know, sly comments about chicken or people saying you must play basketball and things like that. There's this one instance I will probably never forget. I was doing an interview and this candidate happened to be a black woman and she was phenomenal. She, I recommended her for the role. She was just, she was just bright. My manager who was not in the interview proceeded to make comments about her performance and her hair. He made a joke about uh, her having big old dreads. And I remember just feeling infuriated, but try to keep my cool and I educated him on the difference between locks, twists, and braids in a way that paid homage to the culture. And the way in which he dismissed it and then made a secondary comment about her appearance. And I had to check him. I was like, first of all, we're not the fashion police. Our job is to assess whether or not she can or cannot do the job. Second of all, um, as a manager, you cannot be making those types of statements about women. That's not your place. And then I handed in my resignation about a month or so after. I knew I just couldn't work at a place like that with managers who thought like that. And I think also because I work in HR, my role is to check managers. And at the same time, I'm a victim of microaggressions myself. So it creates this very unique experience. But that's my experience with workplace racism. Thank you so much for giving me the platform. Wow. Um, again, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking because like this person shared, this was coming from someone that they had a relationship with. Mm -hmm. Someone that they loved and cared for and had a bond with. Mm -hmm. And for things to just turn so negatively mm. and reveal that that was the actual underlying sentiment this entire time. Or maybe it wasn't. Who knows? Maybe it's something that came up recently. Maybe they... Who knows? But for things to escalate to such a point is very heartbreaking, for one. And the second point that was made was that the people who were supposed to defend, represent, and protect her did not. They failed her in that moment. They failed to address the injustice of what was taking place. They failed to speak up for mm -hmm. her and be fair in how they were dealing with the the consequences or punishments, et cetera. Now, on to the last video that we saw. I think, and it's interesting that it touched on, that experience touched on something similar to what you were talking about in the workplace, the hairstyle and the, the negative connotation or the negative assumption mm -hmm. that comes with seeing people with particular hairstyles. Funny. <laughs> and it happens, right? Yeah. But the importance, is, again, is to making sure, like Eddie mentioned in his video, that we're checking ourselves. All the time. You need to be aware of what you're doing, what you're saying, how it's coming across, how it could be perceived, and making sure that you're checking where that desire to make that comment comes from. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Where did that stem from? Yeah. It didn't just roll off your tongue out of nowhere. It came from someplace, a thought that you had, mm -hmm. an ideology that you support and follow. So it's important to make sure that we're keeping ourselves in check all the time. And, you know, that kind of brings us into talking about what our role is and mm -hmm. what our responsibility is, um, especially as Christians. What is our mission? What is Christ's mission for us? Mm -hmm. um, and I want us to look at a couple of um, scripture passages, some yes. texts. Um, so the first one we're going to look at is 1 John 4, 
verse 20. Um, in the King James Version, it says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Mm. I think that text is, is very real. Very. It's deep, but it's very real. And it's pointing out the obvious. Mm -hmm. How can we say that we love God and in the same breath spew out hate towards our brother? Yeah. What I, what I should say, what we need to make sure we point out, as we've gone through this conversation station, mm -hmm. we have said a, a lot about um, racial injustice pointed at black folk. Mm -hmm. we, with this text, need to realize that when we dislike or hate our white brothers and sisters, mm. our brothers and sisters that are Asian or Southeast Asian, you know, that when I grew up in school, it was this distinction between the Canadian white person and the European white person mm -hmm. that they were, you know, they kept that distance from them we got to recognize that there are good people out there. Exactly. So we then need to recognize it from a text like this. Exactly. That we have to love our brother. We can't fall into the trap as much as there is so much, much mistreatment mm -hmm. that may come our way. We can't deflect it back and say, well, I'm going to hate you then because this is what you did to me. Because of course we know the text that says, you know, you were once told an eye for an eye. Right, mm -hmm. but you should turn the other cheek. So we we need to find the ways to be wise, but harmless. Exactly. All right. Another text that I kind of want us to look at is Acts ten, verses thirty four to thirty six. Yeah, I have that one right. Perfect, here. Biggs. So it says here. Then Peter replied, "I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism." In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord of all, or sorry, who is Lord of all. And that is Acts 10, 34 to 36, and that's the new, oh, sorry, the new living translation. Hmm. Awesome. Yes. And again, we see here the importance of not showing favoritism. Mm -hmm. Why is one race preferred or favored over another? Yeah. Right. And just as you mentioned before, it's important for us to check ourselves and make sure that the same thing we are protesting about, the same equality, the same type of treatment that we're wanting to receive, that we're displaying that to other people. Right. Yeah. We can't be expecting treatment of a certain way and a certain level of respect and not be willing to demonstrate that ourselves. Right. You know, we have the golden rule that says treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. We got to make sure that we are doing that ourselves, you know, as well and making sure that we're representing Christ and his character and sharing that love, right? Again, mm. like the first text said, we can't, claim to have the love of God in our hearts but be spewing out hatred yeah. towards okay. our brothers and sisters. We're all equal, made in his sight. Um, the last text that I want us to look at, and if we could pull, actually let's both pull it up. Okay. James 2 verse 1. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory with respect of persons. All right, and this... Um in the New Living Translation, James 2, verse 1, interestingly titled the chapter says, A Warning Against Prejudice. Mm. So, my, brother, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Wow. So. Again, <laughs> that point, we cannot claim to be lovers of Christ. We cannot claim to have God's love in our heart. We no. cannot claim to have that be our purpose if we're not first demonstrating that and showing that and pouring that out. 
And I think in all things, we see examples of the cross. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the horrible treatment of brethren around the world, our brothers and sisters around the world who are suffering because some people are showing favoritism of one race over another, Mm -hmm. it breaks my heart. And it causes me to think as a Christian, the heartbreak and pain that Christ endured and experienced when he was bearing that cross. Mm. How people were spitting at him, throwing things at him, mistreating him. But yet in all things, he kept his eyes forward yes. and he continued to bear the cross. It, just, it could be said that, yes, we have crosses to bear that are tougher than others. What do we do with that? It may not be the popular thing to talk about, mm-hmm. but we definitely need to keep the conversation happening. I 100% agree. Well, Biggs, thank you so much for sharing your insight, your experiences, and just your words of wisdom regarding racial injustice and racial prejudice today. Um, and to those of you watching, I just want to encourage all of us as this discussion is a reality for a lot of us. And my prayer is that we can be encouraged, that we can continue to push forward, we'll continue to keep ourselves in check. Remember that if we profess to have the love of God within us, that we cannot spew out hate towards our fellow man and our brethren. Um, continue you know, representing yourself, representing God um, in a respectful manner, and hopefully, with more conversations, with the protests going on where we're trying to get our voices heard in the community, Mm -hmm. with sharing your experiences and sharing your testimonies and educating people around the world, we can see some improvement with what's happening in our society today. So thank you guys again for tuning in to I Testify Conversation Station. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe.